Welcome to Sputnik, orbiting the world with me, George Galloway. And me, Gayatri. The world has rightly recoiled in horror at the extreme pornography of violence in Iraq, the videoed beheadings of now two American journalists by the self-appointed caliphate of ISIS has attracted world attention to their savagery in a way which the mutilation and massacre by them of thousands of others in Syria and Iraq has not. Meanwhile, the font of fanatic extremism in Saudi Arabia remains the West's best friend and lucrative customer. The prevailing ideology of Saudi Arabia shares points of contact with that of the neighboring caliphate. And one of those is the public televised severing of people's heads. The Saudi dictatorship has recently embarked on a frenetic spree of public beheadings, dozens of them in just the last few months. Amnesty International has been working hard to attract media and public attention to these beheadings with so far limited results. That's why we're delighted to welcome on board the Sputnik, Sivag Kechichian, and I'm glad that you're here to explain what I had no knowledge of at all, this huge increase in the number of beheadings. Give us a scale of this first, please, Sivag. Thank you for having me, George. Basically, we've noticed, we've seen that in the last month alone, between 2 September, 2, 2 August and 2 September, there's been more than 30 executions, almost all of them public beheadings. So that's almost daily. Daily. At least one a day. And the vast, although the vast majority of these have been on murder charges, these death sentences, but many of them are drug smuggling, and one of them is actually for sorcery or witchcraft, which is not even a crime in international law. So this is extremely alarming, and it points or it raises a number of questions for us. For one thing, it clearly states that Saudi authorities do not have, do not have regard to human life. Many of these cases that we have been able to document, it's clear that death sentences were handed down after unfair trials, and that is not acceptable. In some cases, the only evidence seemed, seemed to be coming from confessions which were extracted under torture and deception. Is the regime vulnerable at the moment? I mean, what, what would explain uh, what had been a fairly routine pattern of beheadings and this spree that I described? I think that's basically the question that is being raised now. What explains the surge in executions? And I think it's given that this is Saudi Arabia we're talking about, it's impossible to tell the decision making behind these closed doors. What I imagine is happening, or what I think explains the surge, the increase in the numbers, is a number of factors. One is that if you look at 2000, the annual rate of execution in Saudi Arabia in 2013 and 2012, they're almost identical. Around 79 people were executed in 2013 and 2012 each year. Now, if you look at last year, 2013, in the first half of the year, the numbers were extremely high. So it was not going to stay below 100. And then the last six months of the year, the numbers sharply dropped. There were one or two executions in the second half of the year, very few. This year, it's the opposite. It started very low, and then Ramadan came. And during Ramadan, there are no executions do not take place. And then, so we had 17 by July of this year, so 2014, from January to July, 17 executions. I think the authorities, so at one of the explanations is that the authorities have a certain amount of people and statistics they want to keep, and they want to keep that at the national level. So in other words, there is that, let's say, cutoff point. So very low at the beginning of this year, we can increase the execution rate to reach that number 80, let's say. Now, other reason, I think there is a political dimension to this as well. I think the authorities are concerned of what's happening in the surrounding areas, in the region in general, especially in the aftermath of 2011. 
And I think they want to send a strong message to everyone, saying that we're still in charge, we're still strong, and we'll punish any transgression. I'm a politician. I'm across the news all the time. I specialize in the Middle East, and I knew none of this until I read your Amnesty International report. That means this hasn't impacted in the international mass media at all, or even the niche media that I read. How do you account for that? I think that has been a long struggle for us. Basically, there are some news coming out of Saudi Arabia that is covered, and the most that is covered, believe it or not, the, the news that gets best coverage is beheadings. Mm. So this is actually the maximum media coverage that you would get. So there's a lot of things that are happening in the country that are, there's no news whatsoever on. So I think the, this is common. I mean, it's been happening for years, if not decades now, that given the, the situation of Saudi Arabia, its international status, both as a regional ally and as an economic power, so the ge geostrategic and the economic relations between the Western countries and Saudi Arabia, there's less and less interest in basically commentary from the authorities of Western governments and therefore not much encouragement when these things come out in media to make a noise out of or to discuss publicly. What we hear from these authorities is that they're raising these issues privately with the Saudis. So they call them to discuss, to raise concerns over the phone. Yeah. Now the issue with that is that we don't know if that really yeah. happens or not. And there are no, there's no change coming out of, out of those discussions apparently. So we've been encouraging them to raise concerns publicly. That's the way that you can influence the Saudi authorities to respond to this international outcry. So while I cannot explain why the media in this case have not covered, let's say, as, uh, as wide as the coverage has been on ISIS and other executions, I cannot explain why not on Saudi Arabia as much on the Saudi beheadings. But I think the general explanation, the, the historic situation is behind this, the, the terms of uh, the alliance, the causes, and also the idea that eventually in Saudi Arabia there is supposed to be a court, a trial of some sort, uh, leading to the, to the execution, regardless of whether or not we, found, we find that grotesque, beheadings, public executions, that there is a process behind it, mm. of a trial, of conviction, etc., which is not actually true. T tell us, tell us about those um, that get executed. Are these Saudis or are they mostly migrants? So that's another interesting factor, actually, that the more than 50 percent, more than half of those executed annually are foreigners, are foreign migrants and typically migrant workers. And there are multiple reasons, I think, for that, one of which is that they are not very well informed of Saudi laws which aren't, most of, most of which aren't codified. So you don't know what the law is. Second, because they, they do not have access to translation facilities or to lawyers, so they might be framed yeah. in, a, in a crime, let's say, yeah. in a domestic crime of some sort, yeah. end up in jail, be sentenced to that without knowing what's going on, and then yeah. executed. So, which is extremely concerning. And most of these, um, including um, last year in 2013, there was a, a, f um, a foreign domestic worker, 17-year-old girl, who was executed. A girl? A 17-year-old 17 girl. 17-year-old girl named Rizana Nafik, who was um, a Sri Lankan uh, girl. And it was clear that she was 17. All the authorities claimed that in her passport it said it, she was 18. Now the authorities later, the Sri Lankan authorities, clarified it, saying that her passport was forged so that she can get a job, say 18, but that yeah. they ascertained, they said, we confirmed that she's not. That didn't matter. Didn't matter. Didn't matter so at they all. violate the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child. Child, absolutely, yes. I'm, I'm stunned by that. Uh, I'm momentarily uh, speechless. They severed the head of a 17-year-old girl. Yes. The uh, Saudis, as you and us both know, uh, are big customers of ours. They're big geostrategic allies. Even though, as Gayatri said, they are the font of this extremism, not necessarily the government, but uh, all of these extremist groups draw great financial and other support 
from inside uh, Saudi Arabia. The world is transfixed at the moment uh, with these hideous, grotesque executions of Western journalists, which make front page news, top of the news, everywhere in the world. So it's like there's a tariff. ISIS can execute Syrians and Iraqis in their hundreds, maybe thousands. Nobody cares. Uh, Saudi Arabia can behead dozens, one a day. Nobody much cares. This must be painful for you at Amnesty International, struggling to highlight all of these crimes. All of them are crimes, and you're struggling to highlight them all. Absolutely, and to keep basically the attention on what we think is really important here, which is that we believe as Amnesty International that all executions or all death sentences are a clear violation to the right of life. They are the worst, the cruelest, and the most inhuman and degrading punishment, regardless of how they are done. Is it beheading or chemicals or shooting, whatever it is? And the human life is human life. Basically, we are against all forms of executions. Now, what's been happening in the region with the ISIS, and not even last year before ISIS gained the current prominence, is that the Middle East is the, was the area where we, see, we saw the surge in executions. The executions continued more or less the way it has been in the last years, whereas the rest of the world, we saw a decrease. Now, the, the point here is that the, these, these regimes that have been carrying out the executions in the Middle East and have increased have not received any criticism, while all the attention has gone to these armed groups like ISIS. So whereas ISIS and others, all humans, have obligations in international humanitarian law, Saudi Arabia as a state, as an internationally recognized state, for example, has further obligations because it's member, it's part of a number of treaties that it has signed, including Convention on the Rights of the Child. So they have, the demand on them should be far higher because of these, um, or the expectations should be far higher because of these international treaties that they voluntarily signed. Yeah. I actually, I'm very curious about Amnesty's work, but also the support that you get locally. Do you get any support locally from the people? Because it's funny when you speak about public beheadings. I always wonder who this public are. Are the public are still enjoying it? Uh, that's a really difficult uh, question to answer, I think. In a sense, um, we have to admit that in a number of countries in the world, especially including places like Saudi Arabia, um, it's been part of the, a very long history, the, um, the executions, including the public beheadings. So there is, and generally speaking, it's accepted that the death penalty is um, a legitimate punishment for some crimes. I mean, it is supposed to be a spectacle. It is supposed to work as a deterrent, supposedly, mm -hmm. for others. Although there's no, absolutely no evidence whatsoever. No, no on, your figures, someone. On, on your figures, it's, uh, it's yeah, vaulting. Exactly. Sivak, we've got to leave it there. Thanks very much for you, joining us. We'll, we'll, we'd like to talk to you again about it. Coming up after the break, a bright young man with a great future ahead of him. On a grand old man with a great past behind him. Not me, Bob Dylan. Don't miss it. Welcome back to Sputnik. I consider Bob Dylan to be the greatest writer since William Shakespeare. He righted a few wrongs, he wrote some of the best songs, and I even like his voice. Or should I say voices, for he has had several. I've paid a fortune to go and see Bob Dylan over decades. Our guest today has seen him more often than I, and he's only 21 years old. He's here to discuss the original Vagabond and Ian Bell's biography of the star, which has just been released in paperback. He's Dylanologist Ryan Al-Hakim. Ryan, this is the second volume of Ian Bell's uh, work, Time Out of Mind, The Lives of Bob Dylan, Voices of Bob Dylan, Lives of Bob Dylan. What did you, as a, an expert uh, in the field, make of this one? Well, I think instantaneously, as you've noted, when you read that title, The Lives of Bob Dylan, it goes to the heart of the fact that there really is no continuity that can be pointed to in, in the life of Bob Dylan. From just opening the book, you see a quote by Ginsburg. He says, I don't think Bob Dylan has a self. And that really strikes at the heart of what Bob Dylan is about. Over a career of 50 plus years, he's reinvented himself so many times that there's no longer the Bob Dylan of the 1960s. He doesn't exist anymore. 
Dylan himself has said that in interviews. He said, I don't know that person anymore. He's really? not he's not me. <laughs> so Dylan doesn't recognize himself and I think immediately Ian Bell has caught on to that with, with this book. What's especially nice about uh, Ian Bell's book is that as a political journalist, of course, he won the Orwell Prize. He imparts knowledge of the political scene, the political context in which Dylan operated in and continues to operate in. This is a person who has been massively influential in popular culture and American history, world history. And you have his story in, in Bell's book uh, encapsulated, I think, better than uh, any other that I've read. No. Let's talk about some of the lives. Uh, Dylan burst on the scene, the New York uh, cafe scene, Greenwich Village, in the coldest winter for uh, many years. Uh, he played in these coffee shops just to get out of the cold wind. Uh, and the zeitgeist, just a year or so later, uh, reached its crescendo, the civil rights movement, Martin Luther King's arrest, uh, the murder uh, of uh, Medgar Evans, and so on. Uh, then the Vietnam War begins, and he becomes, in a way, a spokesman for uh, the opposition to nuclear weapons, the Cold War, the Vietnam War, racism in America. And then, politically speaking, he fades. Well, Artistically, he flourishes, but... Politically speaking, he fades. How does Ian Bell explain that? Well, with Bob Dylan's poli uh, politics and political messages, it's sometimes difficult to know just exactly what Dylan thinks. And I think it's perhaps a mistake to say that he ceased to become uh, political, ceased to be political. Perhaps he ceased to be overtly political. I might put it that way. But starting at the beginning, like you mentioned, with uh, the 1960s civil rights movement, not a lot of people know, but when uh, Luther King made his I Have a Dream speech uh, 51 years ago, Dylan was there, and he sung at the March on Washington. Oh, did he? So he was, he was there at that time, sort of through his music, galvanizing public opinion. He never wrote a song specifically about... Uh, civil rights, but the emotions and the senses of justice that were in his words, which had never been seen really in rock songs before, with that marriage of folk, blues, country and, and rock, which Bob Dylan introduced, you started to find that. And so whilst in the 60s you have overtly political actions, later on that, that does cease, overtly political actions. But the music doesn't really change, I would say, the same sense of right and wrong, of uh, freedom, liberty, remains in his music. And so if you're looking for lyrics that you can say immediately, this is about this particular political subject, you can't find that. But even to this day, you can still find that, that sense, um, that political message, um, not to put too fine a point on, on message, because Dylan's songs aren't really uh, teleological in that sense. He doesn't have an end in mind. He doesn't want to change a particular thing through one song. Mm. But through the songs, things do change. Um, Just one, in fact, uh, Hurricane, which is one of his very best songs, was a song about Reuben Carter, who could have been the champion of the world, but ended up like Buddha in a ten-foot cell. Uh, Dylan helped spring him from Prison, didn't he? Well, that's that's right, and this is uh, from a 1976 album called Desire, and Dylan met Carter and immediately concluded that he wasn't guilty of this crime. He spoke to him for hours in prison, and wrote this uh, song more overtly than any other song he's written. This is the song for which he wanted to achieve something. He would say in his concerts, "We need to free this innocent man." And so it was that with the song, people began to know about what wouldn't have been such a big mm. story. Uh, it had a mass uh, public appeal. People began to understand who Reuben Carter was. And so I think the important part about Hurricane is the involvement with the public consciousness. Ian Bell is very realistic in the way he describes this. 
He doesn't want to say that Bob Dylan freed Reuben Carter. I don't think that's the, the case at all. As it happens, the reason why he uh, was no longer in prison was because the prosecutors decided not to have a third trial. His innocence or guilt was never finally concluded. However, I think Bell makes a very good point when he says that Dylan recognized that even though Carter might not have been the best of black men, doesn't make him a guilty black man. Yeah. And I think Dylan recognized that, and it's a theme that runs mm. uh, through mm. the songs that he's done since. Yeah, true. Many people argue that the songs he's written should have been sung by others, including myself. I wouldn't say I was forced to listen to Bob Dylan during our long road trips, but... You are. <laughs> how, uh, how, would you, how would you say that? So you, you, what you're saying is great songs, not a great voice. Well, I mean, I'm bound to disagree with you, but I can understand where you're coming from with that. There's something immediately that people find unpalatable about the voice, whether it's the 1960s sort of high-pitched uh, whining that you might <laughs> describe it as. Yes, yes that's or the, how I would or, describe it. And then later growling. The, the later growling, the gravelly, the gravelly voice. So if you want something with uh, more public appeal, then Adele's cover of Make You Feel My Love is uh, an excellent example. And the, the that's the biggest selling Bob Dylan song in, in history. That's right. Uh, I'd make the point that Dylan has never actually had a number one single. Oh. He's had a number of number one albums, but never a number one single. So popular appeal in terms of chart success has never been his strong point. I think his golden age was around the time of the album Desire and Blood on the Tracks, which for me is the best album ever made by anybody. And one track, in fact, every track could be a movie, uh, but the, uh, the Tangled Up in Blue uh, is, to me, the most cinematic song uh, ever recorded. And I also think his voice was at its very best then, around about the Budokan uh, tour, live at the Budokan in Japan. What do you think of that? I think, I think that's right. There are lots of people who think that Blood on the Tracks is Dylan's best work, the sort of the pinnacle of his uh, achievements as a songwriter and as a, as a singer. I think there's a lot to be said for that view. Particularly uh, Tangled Up in Blue, as you mentioned, Dylan has said him himself of that song that it has past, present and future all sitting in the same room together. Mm -hmm. And in that way, it certainly is cinematic. Um, it's also been described as the best breakup album ever written because around this time Bob was uh, divorcing from, the, from, yeah. from his wife. Yeah. So you see a different side of Bob Dylan there, a more uh, personal side than you will have uh, seen before. I always before. Uh, saw myself as the jack of hearts in that uh, album. Uh, although I must tell you this, the best Dylan song I've ever heard him perform, he didn't write from uh, from uh, Natural Born Killers, Killers, from the soundtrack of Natural Born Killers. He sings a 1950s song. What's it called again? You Belong to Me. Mm -hmm. It's only two and a half minutes long. It's absolutely magic. Yes, I think uh, there's something uh, interesting about Bob Dylan's association with uh, film. Sometimes you have uh, very good work that he's done specifically for films. What comes to mind is uh, the 2001 film Wonder Boys, in which he wrote the song Things Have Changed, which yeah. in fact won him an Academy Award, which he proudly has on his piano uh, in the concerts he, he does now. And so there is something cinematic about his songs. You can't put a lot of songs in uh, films and expect them to tell a story. But that's exactly what mm. Bob Dylan's mm. songs do. They, they tell a story and they speak to people. I would say on an elevated level than, than other music. Well, as, uh, as Bob Dylan would put it, thank you. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> and now it's your turn to tell us what you think through the portals of social media. What's rattling, Gayatri? So there's been a surge of beheadings in Saudi Arabia, but an absence of condemnation from the West. Why? Nahid Akhtar answers, because if Saudi Arabia was an exporter of bananas, it would be condemned. But because it keeps Joe on the road, it's not. Mind you, though, Jack Tipple reminds us that UK is no stranger to beheadings as Malaysian insurgents discovered. Yeah, in the 1950s, the British army was paying 25 shillings a head, yep. literally a head, yeah. to uh, the heads of communists were worth 25 shillings each. It brings the question, though, whether 
UK's ties with Saudi Arabia makes the UK complicit to crimes to humanity. Imran Rawood answers that I think it could even be that Saudi's close ties with the UK make them complicit in crimes <laughs> against humanity. <laughs> very good, very good point. And finally, on Bob Dylan, Luke answers, voice, voice, I love all Bob Dylan's different voices. Well, me too. The lives of Bob Dylan, the voices of Bob Dylan, all of them are truly great to me. Well, that's all that we've got for this week. Which, alas, means it's the end of the show. Do please keep in touch with us on Twitter at RT underscore Sputnik. And on Facebook, you can like us on Sputnik on Russia Today. This goodbye from me, Gayatri. And from me, George Galloway. It's been marvellous.